to this month's episode of the Crimmer Talk. I have again, as we did last month, <laughs> Megan and Laura today on the panel with me. Um, and we're talking about fantastic serial killers. Okay, let's take away the fantastic. But yeah, we're talking about serial killers today. Um, efficient serial yeah, killers. Yeah, you know, efficient. Kill at least three people in most cases. So they are fantastic. They are they are good at what they do. Definitely. Fantastic. Is definitely the wrong word. Wish they'd chosen something else, like I don't know, gardening or something. Okay, and the Google definition I've got here. A murderer should have killed three or more victims over the pe- period of greater than 30 days. Um, and that's the definition I've got there. I'm a bit worried about you, Janice. Um, we start off with fantastic serial killers and now we're saying murderers should kill yeah, it should more than kill. three people. <laughs> <laughs> that's the checklist. Should they have killed more than three people? If they haven't, what else have they been doing with their time? You know. And how would you define it? Well, very similar really. Someone who, serial killer is someone who should not have, but has, um, <laughs> killed three or more people in a period of 30 plus days. I mean, I guess one of the things that from your first definition that's interesting is that that definition um, and Professor Wilson's definition would kind of also encompass hitmen, which I, I, yeah. think, I think we can actually, as long as we recognise mm. that they are they are atypical and their motives are different. I think perhaps we, we should consider them, but I guess that's, that's yeah. debatable. Yeah, never, I've never yeah. actually thought of it in that way at all. But it's really definitely, uh, I think, necessary mm-hmm. to consider them because they do, and for the idea of gratification as well. Um, mm. Sorry, completely cut you up. <laughs> no, it's all right. Into, I've not really got anything to add to the definition that already, already hasn't been mentioned. So. Okay. Um, and do you believe that serial killers share the same tendencies? Ooh, well, I think the the, the hitman example might be um, something where we would where, where we would so they're not necessarily exactly the, the same tendency. Although you can maybe link it in, but I think that what kind of unites them is a desire to escape and escape into a sort of fantasy world. Mm-hmm. So that fantasy world might be really really different. So for some people, it might involve righteous retribution, you know, people who have killed, say, for example, sex workers, people who have killed, potentially, I suppose, in theory, some vigilante killers, people who have killed those that they feel have wronged society, get a lot of racial hatred, um, you know, killers who, who kill based on, on racial or, or class hatred and prejudice, which one's that category, sexual gratification as well, you know, people like Jeffrey Dahmer, or you know just general sort of complete control and I think what really unites these and also you also could encompass hitmen as well is this idea of dehumanizing victims and also expressing their own idea of, of, of ultimate kind of power and control um, but what's interesting I guess is that some of the motives are also common for other killers um, and for um, you know sexual offenders but I think with the serial killer one of the differences is that if someone's progressed to that stage, usually the fantasy is never enough. Mm. The reason why it's a serial killing is because the fantasy is always just out of reach. The actualization of what they imagine they will feel and experience and be able to see in the face or hear in the screams or whatever it might be of that that person that they're murdering um, doesn't actually match it. So it's it's almost kind of like a like a drug addiction in that it's you it, you know you need progressively harsher and harsher you know sort of stimuli to to reach this kind of I- idea of, of promise of, of what you think will be your ultimate hit. Um, and also it's used as like a distraction from everyday life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, people like um, you, you know, like uh, you know, the Green River Killer, for example, lived a very mundane sort of life, had quite a sort of stable-ish sort of marriage at, at, at one point in, in particular. Um, and yet, um, Gary Ridgeway, that's what I was, sorry, I was trying to say, Gary Ridgeway, um, and, and that was kind of used, his, his, his use of sex workers and then an escalation to, to killing them, was kind of used as like a distraction from his everyday life in a way some people might drink or take recreational drugs. Um, and some offenders obviously become increasingly violent or depraved. Um, in an attempt to, to gain these kind of feelings of dominance and so that can lead from, from physical assault to rape to murder or in the case of people who are already serial killers in someone like say Ted Bundy it can go from being um, from being murder to murder and necrophilia and then if you take an example of someone like um, obviously like Jeffrey Dahmer yeah. it 
it escalates even to the form of, of cannibalism, which I guess is kind of like the ultimate dehumanising of people. So basically, I think what, what kind of the tendencies they kind of share are to completely dehumanise people, to feel the need to escape from reality, um, rich fantasy life, and a kind of escalation in, in depravity. Yeah. I've, on my notes, I think one more to add to that list is just the notion of controlling um, situations. Because mm, yeah. um, a couple yeah. I've, I've looked at, I've only got a note here on the one particular one I'm really interested in, I'll talk about her later. Um, but I have said um, some serial killers feel the need that they have to control a situation like mm. this. Like, as you explained before, there's some things that go on in the world that they personally defy or um, feel strongly against them it's they feel like they need to mm. cleanse the world in a sense um, yeah. and that's their yeah. method of doing so i agree it's, it's always got to be about i think it's, it's always about control it yeah. might be about controlling who's in the world controlling someone's sexual and, and that i think that's often for necrophilia and cannibalism that mm. is that is yeah. the ultimate control yeah it's the, it's the can like the control and the power isn't it because yeah. obviously something that that happens possibly with or tends to happen with serial killers is that the, the crimes tend to be quite similar or there's similar trophies mm -hmm. taken from each scene and stuff like that. Um, but then that's almost like you're saying building upon the fantasy as well, like making mm -hmm. it, it's the same but it's there's something different that makes it better, well, for them. And then mm -hmm. the, the next time, the, the next victim, there'll be something additional to it again that'll mm -hmm. make it different but it's, the, it's so, so it's kind of like the same, them. yeah. Um, but then, yeah, just in terms of control and power, it can it can happen where obviously with relations to power where the, the individual has high power status and therefore feels invincible mm -hmm. or they can have like a low power status so then or they feel like they're perceived in that way so then the way that they commit their crimes it's almost like they are in control and in complete power of that of that person yeah. so, so it is it's all about fantasy good perspective. Yeah. Um, Talking of perspectives, my next question. Um, from a criminological perspective, and your psychological, if you want to throw that in there. Um, I should have changed the question. Um, do you believe there are any preventative methods um, or treatments for such offences as serial killing? Because, you know, your average incidents or average crimes, you can always sometimes think, okay, well, that's the crime, we'll prevent it this way. And I, I feel like personally with serial killing, it's not as straightforward mm. because not every offence is the same. Well, every repeat of offence is the same. Not every offender chooses the same method. Like you say, some go down the route of cannibalism, some don't. Mm. Um, some choose to target their, you know, specific victims, some don't, etc. Um, so I think personally, I think it's quite difficult to think of a specific treatment. Mm. Um, but do you do you want to kick this off? Because you'll probably call it from a different perspective. Yeah, in in terms of yeah, in terms of like from the forensic psychology perspective, it's the idea of or the debate of whether a, a killer is is born or whether they're, they're made. Mm. Um, and from from my perspective, it it is kind of. I'm trying to think what I've wrote here. So it's, I've got it so that research has shown that an individual can be born with sociopathic, psychopathic tendencies and lead a crime-free mm. life. Mm. Um, and that these individuals are called high-functioning psychopaths. Um, so they can be like doctors, lawyers, they'll be good at business, they're good at negotiating and, and things like that. Um, but they're just as perceived, uh, sorry, so they're perceived as, as normal, but they just mm. lack empathy. Yeah. Um, so they lack empathy and have little conscious uh, consciousness and, and stuff. Conscience? Conscience, oh. that's it. <laughs> Conscience is aware. Yeah. You've got to be a bit worried about this panel. You've got a lady who doesn't know what a conscience is. You've got a lady who thinks that serial killers are fantastic. I'm here to protect the great British public. Um, I always get conscious and <laughs> unconscious. <laughs> I was thinking, no, that's the right word, that's the right word. I've even brought to your conscience, but then I always mix it up with, like, being unconscious. Oh. And that brings us to our final question. Um, which serial killer sticks out to you the most and do you find most intriguing? Um, yeah, so for me, it's, it's um, a serial killer that was Ed Gein. Uh, he was also known as the Butcher of Plainfield. Um, and he committed his crimes during the 1950s. And what initially started everything off was with the death of his mother, who, who he was quite strongly connected to. Uh, he described her as his best friend. Mm -hmm. And what he would do is he would go to his local graveyard and he would exhume bodies. 
um, and from those he would create trophies um, and like keepsakes from the skin. So just a few examples, um, he had uh, human skulls on his bedpost, he, he, he made a pair of leggings from like human skin and he also had sk uh, human skin covering several of his chair seats. So, yeah, he did try and exhume his mother's body, um, but he wasn't successful in that. I don't really know the details as to why. But um, psychologists, in looking at his case, have, have discovered and, and reasoned that what he was trying to do he was trying to like bring his mum back to life because she was such a strong um, role model for him. Um, but yeah, he did also murder two women in, in the local town that he lived, uh, which he got, which is what 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 he got caught for mm -hmm. otherwise he would have just got away with exhuming the bodies yeah. um and he was found guilty but then he it was turned uh, that he was like legally insane mm -hmm. so he went into um he, he was sentenced to M mendota mental health institute so yeah how long ago was it the 1950s it was yeah and, and it was it was this character that um, brought about other characters such as um, like the, the novel Psycho um, mm -hmm. and then the, the character Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So. Uh, oh, I found it really hard to choose, so I, I considered uh, killers like Ian Brady and Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy. One of the reasons why I consider these guys is because obviously they flew in the face of they're all considered to be certainly before they offended, would in general consider to be quite attractive. They all had really high IQs and uh, Brady's like even wrote, wrote um, a book on serial killing and him and to a lesser degree Ted Bundy are really good examples of techniques of neutralisation when you know you just kind of try and sort of explain away your offending why it's not really a problem. But the two, is it okay to say two? Or, yeah. Um, that's kind of settled on both women. Um, the, the reason why I find Rose West to be really, really interesting, and I think probably the most evil person alive in Britain today in terms of serial killing, is because I think she's misunderstood for one thing. I think people often understand her as like an, an accomplice to Fred, but the fact is she actually killed her stepdaughter separately and tried to conceal that fact mm -hmm. from him, suggesting that at the beginning of their marriage at least, she didn't think he had it in him to be a serial killer. She wanted to conceal her murdering from him. Now she'd already killed, I think it was two people by that point anyway, but she didn't know that. Um, and she's a rare kind of clear example of a female sexual sadist. Um, she was often, she was also clearly um, some of her behaviour is informed by interesting things like she was clearly sexually attracted to women but had very bad internalised homophobia. She used to call people, you know, her reason for abusing her daughter at first that she gave was that she feared she was a lesbian and yet she was obviously sexually attracted to women in both a consensual and obviously in a, in a non-consensual sadistic kind of way. Sounds like she had issues with accepting her own personality. Yeah, 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 yeah I think yeah. definitely. Yeah. 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 Um, but one of the most interesting things about her is in contrast to the, to the men I was just talking about is that she had a really low IQ. She was identified as being slow in the kind of un-PC language of when she was at school, when she was um, a student. But she was able to manipulate reasonably intelligent people, you know, she manipulated social workers, she manipulated obviously her neighbours, um, had a reign of terror over her kids who were not identified, I don't think as having particularly low IQs, and also unusually in a, in a male-female partnership, I would, I would say she manipulated Fred. Uh, I know not everyone would, would agree with that, but I think that she actually manipulated um, her husband as well. Um, and so I think she kind of demonstrates that we don't really understand how human intelligence works. We don't necessarily understand what makes somebody clever yeah. and able to operate in a kind of abnormal way. The other example that I, that I think is particularly interesting is Joanne Dennehy. Um, I know she's identified quite often as being particularly evil. I think one of the reasons for that is the double deviance element of it, that she killed like a man, that she manipulated her male accomplices, a bit like Rose, but to a far greater degree, yeah. I would say. Um, you know, the fact that she used, she penetrated men, she stabbed them, she emasculated them by, you know, dressing one of them up in, um, in, a, in a dress before she killed him. Um, 
and one of the things she's fascinating because you know I'd like to know what turned her from being an ordinary, highly socially successful, intelligent um, teenager with no behavioural issues and no recognised history of trauma into someone who was completely out of control, extremely self-destructive with the levels of self-harm, the inability to maintain normal loving mm -hmm. relationships and then obviously becoming you know, a, a serial killer and committing terrible crimes. Um, the thing that I suspect, but have don't have any proof for, given her her victim prof, uh, you know, victim profile and the rest of it, is that she may have been um, sexually abused. And um, I know we talked about um, last time we talked a bit about toxic masculinity. Yeah. I believe that Joan Dennehy thought that if she could take on a toxic masculine role, no one could ever abuse her again. And that would mean that she would target other people for, for abuse. The reason why I think that is because of the age at which she randomly changed. People have normally don't change so much you know, in their, in their mid-teens to, to the extent that she did, with no sign whatsoever of, of, of why that would be. The fact that she actually has tormented Rose West whilst in prison, who is obviously a well-known female paedophile, I think she's... Um, or, or female sexual abuser, I suppose paedophile would be clinically accurate, but um, hebophile or hebophile and um, also sexual abuser. Um, the fact that she, um, uh, the fact that Joanne Dunning as well said that she wouldn't kill any women or any children. I think she sees herself as almost as, as being a man, yet she clearly identifies as a woman. I think she sees herself as in that, in that kind of toxic masculine role. Um, but also, I, I don't think that she would want to target women and children because she doesn't think they deserve to be killed. Um, and also the fact that, that, that before she got to that kind of unravelling moment that a lot of serial killers do, where she sort of turned it into a killing spree and she was stabbing people on the street, she was targeting men that had shown a sexual interest in her. And she was targeting men that I think she thought were trying to use her for sex. Mm -hmm. So there was one man that she was living with who they believe that, no, for certain, but they believe he walked in on her in the bathroom one day and she was outraged by this and she thought he'd done it deliberately even though we're not sure that he did. And so she thought he was a perv and that's why she targeted him. And the other two men she was involved in sexual relationships with one of them was effectively employing her and I think she might have felt that he was trying to exploit yeah. her and this was her way of kind of turning the tables and showing that. So, you know, one of the reasons why I find I find her interesting is because I you know, I find Rosen West interesting because I think we do understand a bit about her and I think she says something interesting about what we don't understand about human nature in general. But the reason why I find Joanne Dennehy interesting is because I think of the reaction to her, which I think is is informed by our view of, of women offenders being doubly deviant, but also um, because I don't think we truly know what turned her into a serial killer, mm -hmm. and I think yeah. I think it would be interesting if we could one day find out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, that's something we can all look into. Well, you know, well, not just us, but hopefully, well, she <laughs> hopefully someone can get the answer. Well, she wants yeah. the yeah. answer. <laughs> <She's welcome. laughs> but that brings us to the end of this month's episode about serial killers. Thank you very much, Megan. Thanks, thank Laura. You. Yeah, thank you. Very informative, and it's been great again. And until next month, keep an eye out on our Twitter, etc., and social media um, mm -hmm. for any updates. Oh, what's your most interesting oh. serial killer? Yeah, that's a good Ooh. one. Who is yours? Let us know. <laughs>